Welcome to Live Greater, the health and wellness podcast brought to you by the University of Maryland Medical System. We put knowledge and care within reach so you have everything you need to live your life to the fullest. This podcast is sponsored by UM Capital Region Health. I'm Scott Webb and just hearing the words open heart surgery may scare many people, but is it as frightening as it sounds? Dr. Jamie Brown, Medical Director of UM Capital Region Health's Heart and Vascular Institute, shares some surprising facts today about the procedure, as well as what every patient needs to know if they will or might need this life-saving surgery. So Dr. Brown, thanks so much for your time today. We're going to talk about open heart surgery. And I think when some of us, most of us maybe picture open heart surgery, we you know, picture open heart surgery. So it's great to have your expertise today and really take us through this. So let's start here. What is open heart surgery? Well, open heart surgery, as most of the world thinks of it, is actually a bit of a misnomer. But let me explain. When a heart surgeon thinks about open heart surgery, they think about actually opening the heart and working on something, for example, a valve inside the heart. But to most people in the world, when you're going to have open heart surgery, that may also mean, for example, coronary artery bypass surgery. But the coronary arteries usually live on the surface of the heart. So it's not really opening the heart per se, but you're opening the person or the patient up to get to the heart, hence the the term open heart surgery. So open heart surgery really generally applies to any operation on the heart, but within the specialty, open heart means you're opening a cavity of some kind and working on something important on the inside of the heart. Yeah, I see what you mean. And that's where I was kind of referencing. It's like we picture sort of open heart surgery, but it's really more open person surgery and you're working on the important things in the heart, related to the heart, connected to the heart and so on. So why would someone need to undergo any of the procedures that we're referencing here? Yeah. So we as humans, of course, get diseases and we're fallible. Heart disease or heart and vascular disease are still the number one killer. And, you know, I think some of these diseases have answers these days, especially, for example, coronary artery disease. When we get blockages in our heart vessels that supply our heart with the oxygen it so much needs, uh, there are a couple things that can be done. Medicines we know now usually is not the first answer, unless someone really is not a good candidate for a procedure. But the first answer usually is a procedure, either a stent with a catheter or coronary artery bypass surgery. Not really open heart surgery, as we said before, but as most people know it, open heart surgery. And of of all the things we can do to kind of make coronary artery disease not such a killer, coronary artery bypass surgery is probably the first choice. Yeah, that does seem, you know, whether it's uh, social media or just uh, regular old media, that does seem to be one that we're probably all familiar with, one that gets to, uh, discussed fairly often. And could, just good to sort of set the scene here and set the record straight. You know, what is open heart surgery? What are you mostly doing when you're doing open heart surgery? And I think that just saying that, right, open heart surgery probably evokes a sense of fear and panic in people. What are some of the Other misconceptions, we've addressed one of the elephants in the room here. What are some of the other misconceptions about having open heart surgery? To get back to your last question, the heart has other parts, of course. It's muscles and blood vessels and valves and an electrical system, and it's attached to the big arterial system in your body. For example, the aorta comes right down and attaches to the heart. So all of those entities can develop a disease. And one in particular, say the valve, the aortic valve in particular, can become stenotic in 12% of the population over 80. So aortic valve stenosis is both a deadly disease and a common disease the older we get. And most recently in the news has been the ability to replace an aortic valve over a catheter. So that's minimally invasive. It is not open heart surgery, but we are still replacing a heart valve. And the most common misconception I see these days in talking about this with patients is they think because it's a catheter and a needle stick, right, and you don't really have a big visible incision, that it's no risk. And I think the point of what's been in all the trials and everything we know is that it's a matter of balancing which is the best pathway for a patient, what's the best choice for a patient. But Even when there's not an incision and it's not per se open heart surgery, the risk is often the same, or sometimes if it's too aggressive with a catheter, greater. So that means that we have to talk with the patient about the risks. And even though they're pushing hard because 
who wants to have open heart surgery and be opened up? Sometimes it's actually safer to be opened up. That's really interesting, you know, because some of the buzzwords in medicine now so commonly heard or what folks would like, what folks want to push for is minimally invasive, smaller scars, faster recovery time. But there may be times coming from an expert here where the actual, quote unquote, open heart surgery is the better option. Is there anything that we can do to prepare, whether it's mentally or physically, for open heart surgery? I've been doing this for a long time now, and I think this is what I've learned works with people and patients is that sometimes if they've just gotten the test and it's brand new news that she was, we're recommending open heart surgery and they have that fear or shock that you uh, referred to earlier. And right then and there, it's time to just walk them through the why, what they have and the why and the potential options. And I always say to them, take your time, unless it is a true emergency, take your time. The most important thing is to fully understand this fully understand your options and understand that we are only recommending this surgery because in balancing all risks and benefits, short and long term, it's the better pathway to take. Once they've done that, then I say, okay, once you understand that, it's normal to be a little bit nervous about any procedure, especially, you know, the scary word open heart surgery. But the best thing you can do is develop a determined, I'm going to do this mindset because when you go into surgery with that determined mindset most of the time the patients come flying out the other side do well come out of surgery get moving walking down the hall and they're out of the hospital in very short order that's good to hear and i'm sure there's a range right you've just mentioned here there's a variety of things you could be doing right so generally speaking when we think about how much time someone's in the operating room on the table how long do these procedures take that's a good question It depends on the procedure, of course, and it depends on a lot of things. But let's say on average, a coronary artery bypass operation, the whole thing is probably four hours. An isolated valve operation may be two hours to three hours. If there's an operation that involves planning with stent grafts and working on the aorta in a big heart and vascular team, then using wires and catheters and x-rays and positioning uh, a big team in a hybrid OR suite with all sorts of x-ray equipment, then that can take longer, the whole intent being uh, to take care of a really big life-threatening problem, but do it minimally invasively. And the number of hours on that can be four to five. And then when uh, someone has had prior surgery, we call it a reoperation. Their heart is often encased in scar. And those operations take longer because the very first step is that you have to very carefully, safely as possible, extract the heart from the scar tissue and then go ahead and do the the heart surgery that's planned. That can be five hours, six hours, seven hours, depending. It's all pretty amazing. You know, you say from just a couple of hours to, you know, something longer than that. But I'm just picturing in my head years ago, however many decades ago, first of all, some of this stuff probably wasn't even possible. And if it was, I'm guessing it wasn't two to three hours for one of these procedures. It may have been all day or even longer, right? Absolutely. Even now, if there's something, you know, really big that's not done typically, for example, someone has a cancer in the back of the heart and we're going to do something that's, you know, out there, complicated, which is take the whole heart out and try to resect the cancer, restructure the heart, sew it back in. That's an all-day thing. But once upon a time, as you just said, when all this started, back in the beginning with the first coronary bypass or the first heart transplant or the first this or first that, it was all day. Absolutely. Yeah. So you mentioned that maybe not in all cases, but in many cases, You know, after folks get over the fear and panic and everything is explained, the why and all of that, and they have the surgery, then they're motoring around and they're on their way. Let's talk about recovery, right? Are we talking about days, weeks? How long does it take from the the time they leave the OR till they really feel like themselves again? That's a good one. So, you know, we try to get them up and at them and off the breathing machine and up and at them in the hospital as soon as we can. And, And I tell them the best way to have the fewest possible complications is to get up and get going. No pneumonias, no clots, out the door in four days. But I say you got to commit to being a patient that's recovering. And so long story short, if they do desk work, you see they're starting to feel pretty good by about four to six weeks. And they can 
start back on desk work, then I, I always tell the patient, don't go back to a big, bad, stressful full day right out of the blocks. It doesn't make sense, and it's also not a good way to start out. But they leave the hospital hopefully going for a walk once or twice a day, and oftentimes they'll be walking a mile twice a day or a couple miles a day by the time we see them at the one-month mark after surgery. Well, this has been really educational. I just love listening to experts and hearing you explain all of this and you know some of the misnomers when we think of open heart surgery. As we wrap up here, doctor, what are your takeaways that you want to share with the audience? I think the field of open heart surgery from the days of it being just a shot in the dark and let's try this and let's try that has come so far. And even though heart and vascular disease is still the number one killer, we of so many things we can do now within the general field of open heart surgery, if you will, at very low risk that I think it's important for people just to not panic when they hear the word open heart surgery, if it's them or a family member, and realize that there are options that are good and can lead to long-term quality of life after the operation is done and the patient's recovered. Definitely. You know, we as patients, of course, want options. And as you say, there there is some fear and panic, sure. But you experts have a lot of tools in the toolbox or the belt or whatever, however you carry your tools into the operating yeah, room. So, right. yeah, it, it's really amazing. Thanks so much. You stay well. You too. Thank you. This episode is sponsored by UM Capital Region Health, the largest health care provider in Prince George's County, dedicated to enhancing the health and wellness of the community by providing high-quality, accessible patient care. UM Capital Region Health, Changing up healthcare in Prince George's County. And find more shows like this one at umms.org slash podcast. And thank you for listening to Live Greater, a health and wellness podcast brought to you by the University of Maryland Medical System. We look forward to you joining us again.